Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. What a fantastic turnout for a chilly night in January. So welcome to the, Geolo the Geological Society of London and to this, the first 2016 Society of London lecture entitled Mineral Solutions to Global Problems. My name is Malcolm Brown and I'm President-designate of the Society. I take up my position in June and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker who is currently President of the Society, Professor David Manning of Newcastle University. The world faces tremendous challenges to resolve the problems associated with climate change and food supply, in both of which minerals have a vital role to play. To achieve ambitious carbon sequestration targets of several gigatons per year, we have to consider reactions on a global scale. And one way to do this is to understand and exploit those taking place in soils, recognizing also the role of plants as a carbon sink and which link soil and atmosphere together. To provide food for a population that will reach 9 billion by 2050, we need to exploit the natural processes by which minerals provide plant nutrients. And these and other areas, minerals really do sustain the human race. David Manning went to Durham University to read geology, moving to Manchester for his PhD in, exper in experimental petrology, then did field work in the China clay areas of Cornwall, introduced him to commercial clay geology. After various postdoctoral fellowships in the UK and France, he took up a new blood lectureship at Newcastle. I'm not quite sure what that is, but it sounds really good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> following the Earth Science Review, he moved in, 1980, moved in 1988 to Manchester, researching clay diagenesis and petroleum systems. In 2000, he was appointed Chair in Soil Science at Newcastle University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor David Manning. Thank you, Malcolm, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming along to hear what I've got to say this evening. And uh, as you can hear from the, from the introduction, that I have a particular interest in minerals and uh, indeed how minerals can save the world. So there's a bit of bias perhaps in the talk this evening, but I want you to go away at the end of the talk with some insight into different ways of thinking about minerals, thinking about mineralogy, thinking about geochemistry and the way in which we use these disciplines or can use these disciplines to help address some of the big problems facing the planet at the present time. And as Malcolm pointed out, it's the global population, the change in global population that drives the problem that uh, I, I want to discuss. Um, we know that the world's population is rising. Uh, the 7 billionth person was born in 2012, and the 9 billionth will be born in 2050. So the world is going to change in that time. The good news is that the rate of population growth is actually diminishing as time goes on. And of course, we see that in, in Northern Europe and other parts of the developed world where the population is not being replaced. Whereas in other parts of the world, the population growth is actually pretty, pretty drastic. And of course, in Africa, we see the situation changing from 1 billion people in 2012 to 2 billion people in 2050. So, so the pressure is really going to be on in some of the poorest parts of the world to cope with these changes. And one of the things we have to think about is how our knowledge of minerals and how minerals behave can be used to help solve the problems of feeding those people and providing other services that are needed to keep the population going. Now, as the population grows, GDP also grows. And the interesting thing is to, to look at the way in which we use minerals. And this is in terms of tonnages. We see in the green block here, uh, over a period of time up to 2005, the growth in construction minerals. That's what's growing. The industrial minerals, materials like china clay and salt and so on, are not rising uh, so much, and the metals are not rising so much. What is rising most drastically is the use of minerals for building, for construction. And of course, that fits. We know that urbanization involves increased amounts of concrete for the built environment, we just have to look at the mega cities that are developing in Asia and South America to see how much concrete is being used. But then if we look at the slope of the graph against population growth here and GDP here, there's a rather closer match to the GDP. And just eyeballing it, it's a very crude way of looking at it, but it, it, it sort of fits, doesn't it? That not only is the population growing, but the prosperity of the population is growing. And as we see the 
the newly growing populations of some of the what we would regard as developing countries increase, we're seeing their wealth increase. And as wealth increases, we want to see we see standard of living and the desire for an improved standard of living increase, and we see demand for minerals increase as everyone wants to have the latest gadgets, everyone wants to live in a comfortable house, and, and so it goes on. So there's immense pressure driven by population growth on our ability to produce minerals. So we need minerals then more than ever. We are a, an animal that consumes minerals, but we do so in different ways. We need minerals as raw materials for industry, for manufacturing of various materials, from our iPhones and gadgets all the way down to bricks and mortar. We need minerals as fuels, and it doesn't matter whether it's a fossil fuel or if it's a, a nuclear fuel, we, we're using minerals for those. And indeed, for the manufacture of um, wind turbines, the manufacture of solar cells, minerals play a vital role in enabling us to deliver those renewable energy systems. We need minerals as fertilizers as well to help provide the food that the population uh, requires. And the list could go on. Everyone could add to that list, I'm quite sure. The pressures that then arise relate to the guarantee of security of supply of minerals. And this is something which has put the wind up government in the last few years, uh, suddenly realising that actually uh, Britain doesn't rule the waves anymore. It, we, we can't uh, uh, count on being able to call upon the metals that we need from uh, sources that are dispersed across the planet because China's already got there first and actually has cornered the market. And we, we're struggling to compete with, with some countries for the acquisition of the minerals that we need. One of the consequences of that is the, the tungsten mine in Plymouth that opened a few months ago, uh, a way of, of, of providing tungsten that is not under China's control. So, so we, we're reacting. Then the other thing that's cropped up, which is a demonstration of pressure, is the whole issue of peak phosphorus, which some of you will have heard of, the idea that phosphorus, an essential mineral for fertilizers and for chemicals, um, actually might be going into decline. I want to discuss that a little bit in the talk. We are going to be using fossil fuels for the foreseeable future, and yet we have a problem because we need to make sure that we try to mitigate the carbon emissions that come from those, and yet we all take it for granted that we can turn the lights on and use electricity. So how can we reconcile those paradoxes? Then we need to think about the way in which minerals can be used to help take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And this leads to the question, you know, what are the alternatives? What might the alternatives be to current practice? And how might minerals feed into those and enable us to do new things with technology, clever technology based on minerals, that helps society to continue to progress and to prosper? I'm going to talk about food to start with. Um, that's uh, the first two-thirds or thereabouts of the talk. And um, I want to think about it from the point of view that mined fertilizers are absolutely essential to support human life. Every time we eat some food, we're eating nutrition that's come from the soil. It doesn't matter where it is in the world or what sort of product it is, the animal or plant, ultimately, uh, the, the, the soil has delivered the nutrients that that crop required to grow. And when we go to the supermarket, we buy those nutrients. We, we're buying soil, the product of soil, when we go to a supermarket. And when we do do that, particularly if we're importing from a country where it might not be quite as wealthy as we are, are we actually paying enough at the till to enable the farmer to put that nutrition back in the soil because there's no way that composted banana skins from the UK are going to get fed back into the West Indian fields where they came from. Uh, we, we have to look at chemical fertilizers as a way of replenishing that. So do we actually pay enough money to enable that to happen? You could regard our supermarkets as mining companies. I, I think that they're one of the biggest mining companies on the planet. And we're part of that mining activity in our weekly shop. So when you next go to the supermarket, you might want to reflect upon your role in supporting mining and, in fact, being a miner by actually buying food that's come from soil where nutrition has been mined by the production of that crop. It's just something to have at the back of the mind. So we'll look at fertilizers a little bit. And we normally refer to fertilizers by their initials, MPK fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash are the key fertilizer minerals that are traded globally. And let's just have a quick look at where they come from. Nitrogen, one normally doesn't think of as having a geological source because nitrogen is derived from the atmosphere using the harbor process as one of the main ways of making nitrogen fertilizers. But it depends on methane, which is a geological material. 
uh, a number of reactions go into allowing that methane to generate hydrogen, uh, and then that combines with nitrogen from the atmosphere to give you ammonium. This is the basic production route for ammonium-based fertilizers. It depends utterly on natural gas to produce nitrogen fertilizers. And the amount of energy required for fertilizer manufacture overall is partitioned so that 90% of the energy consumed in fertilizer manufacture is used for nitrogen manufacture. So we would really be in a very sticky place if we didn't have a fossil fuel industry producing methane, that methane being a raw material for the manufacture of nitrogen fertilizers. And we, we have to pay attention to that when we're thinking about the implications of the price of oil, the future of the petroleum industry and all the rest of it. There could well be unintended consequences which would create major problems for us. Phosphorus is a bit simpler because phosphorus is simply mined from phosphate rock. Uh, conveniently enough, the source of phosphorus is called phosphate rock, an appetite bearing rock. And that is mined to produce phosphoric acid. And then that phosphoric acid can be used to make fertilizers or it can go into other industrial chemicals, including detergents and other materials which we use in our daily lives. Phosphate rock can be used directly without any chemical processing. You can grind it up and put it on the soil and it acts as a fertilizer uh, in its own right. It's a bit slow, but it does work. And the interesting thing about phosphorus is that you can recover phosphorus from wastewaters. Phosphorus causes problems, pollution problems from wastewaters. And the chemistry of phosphorus is such that it isn't too difficult to recover it. And I'll mention this later on. Potash, which is the colloquial name for potassium salts, is mined again. And the materials that are mined do include salts. So chloride of potassium on its own, which is the Rolls-Royce to go for. Uh, magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, double salt for carnalite, and then polyhalite, a, a salt that has potassium, sulfate, calcium, and magnesium all mixed together. These are uh, derived, these are the conventional materials which are used as sources of potassium. And there is some scope for using potassium silicate minerals as sources of potassium for plant growth, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on. But interestingly, there's no evidence that potassium is a problem in the way that phosphorus is to, to water systems. And there's no known way of recovering potassium from wastewaters. So unlike phosphorus, you, your potassium passes through the system and then disappears and dissipates into water systems and doesn't seem to cause any problems and simply cannot be recovered. The price of fertilizers is interesting as well because we can see uh, since the turn of the century, they've chundled along. Oil has gone along in the same way. Oil at the bottom here spiked in 2008 and came down again. There's gradually been rising, and who knows how it's gone down since then. But the fertilizer prices have matched that pretty precisely. Nitrogen in particular, which is the crosses, maps onto the oil price very, very closely, reflecting the 90% uh, oil cost uh, contribution to the production of nitrogen. And phosphorus, because again, there's a, a substantial amount of processing involved in phosphorus fertilizers. Again, that peaked when oil peaked. But potassium didn't. Potassium carried on. Uh, it peaked after, maybe six or seven months after the peak in the oil price, reflecting a different governing factor to that industry. The price is controlled by supply and demand in that context. It's mined from the ground in deep mines, and the manufacturers are able to fiddle around with the price to some extent to, uh, to disconnect it from the other two fertilizers. It came back down, and then it carried on but much higher after that peak than it was beforehand. So we're looking at those prices and their changes and how they relate to oil. And we look at potassium, and potassium is interesting because it reached $1,000 a tonne in some markets in 2008. One of those markets was Brazil, which imports 4 million tonnes a year. Imagine paying $4 billion a year for your import of a fertiliser. It, it, it's not sustainable, and it has caused major problems for Brazil. The price now is about $400 per tonne, $350 to $400 a tonne. It's a price which reflects the fact that the mineral comes from deep mines and there has to be a return on investment to those who paid for the, the, the development of those deep mines. So it's inherently an expensive product. I want to spend a few minutes talking about peak phosphorus and the idea that phosphorus production has reached a point where it can only decline, giving us trouble. So this came out of... Uh, observations based on diagrams like this, which show since the Second World War, which is about here, how phosphate rock really took off as being the dominant source of 
phosphorus. The others are guano, which is down here, human excreta, which is the white line, and manure, animal manure, which is down here. So we can see that phosphate rock is really the dominant industrial component of, of or industrial source of phosphorus for agriculture since the Second World War. There was a paper written in 2009 by Cordell, Drangut, and White, which talks about this, the story of phosphorus, global food security, and food for thought, which addresses the issue in the context of whether or not it matches onto a Hubble curve and is automatically going to uh, decline in the future. Phosphorus is produced quite widely across the world. So we have 95% of the world's production coming from about 16 countries, dominated by China, but spread throughout Asia, not much in Europe, but North Africa and the Middle East, Australia, South Africa, South America, Brazil in that case, and North America with the United States being the dominant producer. So it's dispersed quite widely across the planet. With the peak phosphorus paradox, we see here the, the Hubble curve and the actual and modelled peak phosphorus curves. This is the mining history of phosphorus and the argument in that paper I mentioned was that it would peak around 2030 and then start to come down again in the way that oil production is predicted to peak. And this has caused a lot of discussion. It's one of those papers that has hundreds of citations and has a very high impact. And yet, what's interesting is to look at it in the context of what's understood by reserves and resources and the fact that reserves, when declared, are the material that you know is in the ground and is able to be extracted at a profit under current market conditions. So it's, that is something which wasn't necessarily taken on board as well as it should have been in that paper. I've got resources, which are the materials which have been identified but not yet quantified in the context of current economic uh, uh, extraction and the ability to do that. And then undiscovered resources, which all geologists know are there, if only someone will pay us to go out and find them. And the, the, the analogies might be thinking about what you're going to have for your, your evening meal tonight, because your reserves are what you've got in your kitchen cupboard, and you know are there for you to, to cook and to eat. Your resources might be what they are, what, what's there in the local shop that you know you can go and buy, and you know it's there, but you're not quite sure how much there is and what you're going to choose from the shelves, but it's there. And then the undiscovered resources are what you expect to have delivered to the shops to keep them going. So, so there's a sort of day-to-day -day analogy with the, with the description of reserves and resources that is sometimes quite useful to remember. Now, the United States Geological Survey provides a lot of statistics about different minerals, phosphorus being one of them. And they had a special report on phosphorus in the light of the perceived problems. They identified 1,600 known phosphorus mines on the planet in the terminology of volcanoes, some of these were extinct, some of them dormant, some of them active, but they're, they're, they're there. We know that, that there's phosphate in the ground that maybe could be looked at. Then we're looking at uh, three to 400 years worth of reserves according to the USGS and 1,800 years worth of resources. But look at this in this graph, how that works out, because we've got the reserves down here in the squares, the filled squares. And we've got world production in the crosses here. And the lifetime is in these red circles. So simply taking reserves and dividing by world production gives you the, uh, the, the horizon for the resource. And you can see why people were worried in the early part of this century because 100 years reserves is not a huge amount. But then all of a sudden something happened around 2010 where the reserves multiplied by a factor of three and so of course the projected life went up by a factor of three or thereabouts. What could it have been that did that? It wasn't a wonderful discovery. It was the stroke of an accountant's pen that changed the way in which reserves are declared. So all of a sudden, an artifact was created that allowed this to suddenly have a greater lifetime. And the paper on peak phosphorus was published here, quite right to publish it at that time, when obviously no one knew that this was coming, or when there was a problem. But now I don't think there's so much of a need to, to worry about phosphorus. And I certainly wouldn't lose any sleep over phosphorus, because I think you know, there's plenty of it. And uh, this is one indication of the fact that the declaration of reserves and understanding how much is in the ground is actually artificially constrained and, and, and decided by those who come up with the way in which we declare reserves for the protection of those who invest in getting them out of the ground. And then we keep finding more. So this was an article in the Financial Times, okay, it's four years ago now, but it was, it was big news at the time. The US finding a world-class phosphate deposit in Iraq. Uh, six billion tons, uh, about 9% of the global total, so things like that have happened. Makes you wonder whether or not the war in Iraq was over phosphate rather than oil, but uh, that's another question that might go to some inquiry somewhere. 
And there's a paradox, of course, with phosphorus that we, we do throw it away all the time. And we throw it away through our wastewater streams, through our sewage streams. And the corresponding consequence of that is the pollution that arises, which is a major problem. So we know we can take that phosphorus out of a wastewater stream and we can make this mineral struvite. Thames Water have been making this wastewater, this um, struvite from their wastewater plant uh, in um, a slough. So we know we can do it. But it's just a case of whether or not it's economic and whether it can be done. It's a wonderful material because it's got nitrogen in which is required by plants, it's got phosphorus, magnesium is required, and it's poorly soluble in the sense that it, it doesn't dissolve too quickly, so it's just what you need, it's not going to wash out of the soil too quickly. It's a wonderful material, but it grows wonderful crops, but it hasn't yet found a niche. Maybe that time will come. And using sewage and other wastewater streams as a source of phosphorus is something which gives me confidence that we, we, can, we can solve our phosphorus problems as time goes on. I want to look at potash and connect it with silicon. And you think, why is he talking about silicon? That's not a, a plant nutrient, but they're actually quite important to consider together because they give us evidence that, uh, that there may be a role here for silicate minerals to play. They both occur in the dry mass of a plant. So you come across this in your general knowledge about the way in which cows and other ruminants wear down their teeth. They wear down their teeth because of the silica minerals that are present in grasses. And, uh, the, the abrasive nature of silica helps do that. And you also know this from when you burn material, you find that the ash is there, and that's a silicate mineral that's left over in the ash, at least part of it. But their behavior contrasts geochemically, and that helps us, because if we understand the behavior of one, we might be able to understand the behavior of another if they're coming from the same mineral. So that's what I, I will lead towards over the next 10 to 15 minutes. If we look at rice and sugarcane as examples of crops where these materials are present, uh, we, we can say about 1% of the dry mass of both of those, in fact many plants, is, is potassium. And silica is very rich in, in, in rice, very highly concentrated in rice, particularly the husk that we don't eat. So when rice is being refined, the husk that was around the grain that we do eat, the, the, the husk is separated, that's 30% silica. So it's a very, very silica-rich material designed to protect the grain of rice from predators. And then we come along and we overcome that defense and we eat the rice. And it's about 1% in, in sugarcane as well. So, so there's a range of silica values in these. It's got to come from somewhere. And we take it for granted that it comes from soil. We'll look at whereabouts of soil it comes from shortly. Looking at potassium, first of all, we talk about offtake, which is the amount of potassium and other nutrients that are taken by harvesting. So here we've got a sugarcane harvest going on in Thailand. They're cutting the sugarcane down to take it away. And that, for every tonne here in this lorry, is 1% potassium being taken off the land. So farmers would need to compensate that offtake by putting some fertilizer down on the ground. And if you don't do that and keep it balanced, then you're mining the nutrition from the soil. So just to get the back of the envelope out, you can see in one of these lorries, before it rolls over on the side of the road, it's carrying about 10 tonnes of cane, which is carrying on the back of the envelope about 100 kilograms of potassium. And that's about $50 worth of, of potassium that's being taken away, depending on what you choose to be the price of, uh, of, of KCL. It's a toll, effectively, a toll on the harvest. And somewhere, someone has to put that back. Someone has to put that $50 of potassium back in the soil. Otherwise, you're mining the soil and not keeping it in good heart. It won't carry on producing that crop forever. Getting a bit closer to home, we eat bananas. We don't grow them in this country, but we eat a million tons of them. And the back of the envelope comes up with about a million pounds of the potash that is eaten by us. And where does it go? Uh, we, we, we obviously lose it to our various wastewater systems. How do we know that is being put back into the soil in those areas which grow bananas? And, and we, we need to ask that question and think about it when we're looking at the price wars that are after bananas and how they're used for boss leaders and things like that. You know, what are the consequences that go back all the way down the supply chain to where those come from and how those soils are being mined? Potatoes, we are on a better wicket because, of course, we, we grow potatoes ourselves. 2011 was a very good year for potatoes, I don't know if you remember, but there were 6 million tonnes in the UK potato harvest there, and a record harvest of potatoes, and that's about 6 million pounds of the potash that was taken from soil. But DEFRA is very good at keeping statistics about how farmers replenish the land with fertilizers. And we know that we put it back. You know, it's there firmly in the DEFRA statistics that what we take out of soil, we put back. We're, we're good in this country. Farmers might moan about it and the price of it, but they, they still do it and make sure that the quality of the soil is, is not prejudiced by taking a crop away. 
And that's normally the case in the Northern Hemisphere, in the prosperous part of the world. But when you start looking outside the prosperous part of the world, you, you come up with all sorts of rather worrying statistics. And these come out of nutrient balance studies. Nutrient balance studies are those where people look at the amount of crop that's removed on a country by country basis, and then they look at the amount of fertilizer that is applied in its place and other inputs, and they calculate the balance and see whether it's in positive or negative balance. It's an agronomic uh, approach to understanding farming. And the bottom line is this, that with potash, if we are to balance the amount of potash we take from soils in crops at the present day, we'd have to double the global mined production of potash. And that is a remarkable thought. And that's one of the driving forces behind the decision to grant planning permission to a potash mine near Whitby, which was granted in the autumn of last year. Uh, York Potash got permission to put down a mine to mine that mineral polyhalite, and they're now moving towards that, having to raise the money, of course, to enable them to do it. And they're, they're well on the way to doing that, and we should see a new deep mine in Yorkshire, a kilometre deep. But if you go there for your holidays, you won't see a thing because it'll be invisible. It literally will be all underground. All of the, the facilities needed to make that mine will be underground. And great shame for those who like to see where their minerals come from, but never mind. I, I have to be disappointed on that one. We look at Africa as an example of some of the problems that arise. And Bill Sheldrick, William Sheldrick, and his supervisor, John Lingard, produced this in 2004. It's a really seminal piece of work. William Sheldrick submitted his PhD in his late 60s, early 70s. And it wasn't because it had taken him 50 years to do it. It's because he worked in the industry, in the fertilizer industry, and for the World Bank, advising on fertilizer use for his career. And then after he retired, he did a PhD, doing the agronomy, looking at the offtake and the inputs uh, on a global scale, country by country. And for the continent of Africa, this just shows the sort of thing that was coming out of this. The total output of potassium, this is in kilograms per hectare, is rising. The total input is 40% of that, and the fertilizer input is about 5 to 10% of what was taken out. So we have a gap here. This is the potash gap that's getting ever wider, which is the amount of potassium that's being taken out of the soil and not being put back. So there are decades of mining of potash from soils on an aggregate view in Africa. And that has to be bad news. We then get an independent source of bad news. I'm sorry, this slide is a bad news slide. You look at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, and you see that Africa as a continent produce, uh, consumes less than half a million tons of potash per year. It's the same as the UK. A billion people consuming as much potash as 55, 60 million people. There are, according to the FAO, 57 African countries, and 47 of those buy no potassium fertilizer. That's telling you something. It's, again, not good news. And in aggregate, Africa uses about 1.5% of world potash production, and yet it has 15% of the world's people. That set of statistics, coupled with the, the information from William Sheldrick, is information which causes me to lose sleep at night, because I can't see how that circle is going to be squared. I think there are ways, but it's going to take a lot of work. And the idea that this is in a, a, a region where the population will double by 2050 is, is, is a cause of major concern about how we're going to address this and enable people to keep their soils in good heart so that they can then produce the food that they need to live. The thought of how they cope with the population doubling by 2050 is, 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 is very, very challenging, if not nightmarish. So when we look at where potash is produced, Remember, we, we looked at 95% of phosphorus, so there are lots of little contributions of phosphorus, but 99% of potash comes from just 12 countries. And the biggest spot is Canada, the United States is next, and in Russia and in the, uh, that area of the world. We've got a number of smaller spots in China, and Southern Europe, the Middle East, um, Brazil and in South America, but there's nothing in Africa, nothing in Southeast Asia, nothing in, in Australasia. So we've got a very much more focused production of potash than we have phosphorus, and that actually creates uh, some problems for us. When we look at potash production, taking the statistics and the way we did for phosphorus, no major changes in the reserve base, so it has gone up, and that I think is a change in Russia and the way they, they report their reserves. So that's a minor change, but again, an artifact. But of course, we have this production having a dip, which relates to that very high price, and the reaction such a high price as people didn't bother buying. And so the uh, price 
uh, the, the production rate went down, and of course the lifetime correspondingly went up. But we're talking about 300 years, 250 to 300 years worth of, of lifetime, and, and 7,500 years worth of resources. So you know, there's a lot of it there, but the problem is it's not necessarily in the right place or at the right price. And this is the thing that's special about potash. The price is high in the sense that it's, it, it's about right for repaying the investment made by those who put their money into sinking these mines, but the demand is high, and the difficulty is that that price is too high for those who really need the, the mineral. The other issue is that production is limited to a very small number of countries, but also companies. So we have a very small production market, and it becomes a seller's market in that case. I mean, we worry about oil being a seller's market and what's going on in OPEC. Well, potash is just the same in a way, but it, it affects people in a different way. So that leads to publications like this, Potash and Politics, the title of a paper that came out in 1979 by Paul Rittenhouse. And in his abstract, which was too dismal to read in that previous slide, potash reserves and production facilities are increasingly coming under the control of national governments. The industry outlook will be affected more by political factors than by the economics of the marketplace. And the world market will be dominated by large, politically motivated, government-controlled companies. This was in 1979. So what's happened since then? We look at the web, we look at things which have gone on in the last few years. We have Sirius Minerals, an, an Australian company, buying York Potash for 25 million a few years ago, which is what's led through to that Whitby mine going ahead. So that, that's a, a good news story, if you like that sort of thing. But down here, we've got BHP Billiton turning hostile with the $39 billion Potash Corporation of Canada takeover that they wanted to, to do a few years ago. It would have been the biggest mining takeover in the world. And that was all going well in 2010 until the Chinese waded in and wanted to outbid them. And at that point, the Canadian government suddenly realized that the principles of free market were likely to take them into a situation where China controlled the mining of potash in Canada, which is where the world's biggest deposits are. And they put a stop to it. So they went against their free market principles at the time, put a stop to that. So there was no deal. Potash Corporation of Canada remains in Canada. And effectively, the Canadians control the price and supply of potash. So it's kind of a political decision that was made on the back of that very, very large bid. And a very interesting development. When you look at the web, you find all sorts of things can go wrong. Here we have Belarus holds Ura Russian Euralkali potash boss in price row. So watch your passport when you go to Belarus if you're a Russian. And would you buy used potash from this guy? I mean, it, it, it is, you know, it, it, it's, it's really interesting to look at this and look at how the politics really does work. Even 30 years after that paper, Potash and Politics, the situation hasn't changed. And it really is quite a, a difficult situation. So, summing up for potassium and potash, we, we know that world potash production needs to double to feed the population. We know that suppliers control the market. These are interesting times. And that leads us to think, well, what are the alternatives? And the alternatives is to try to think geologically, go back to first principles of geology and think of, well, what are the alternatives and what can be used? And this has governed geology and the agricultural sector for over 100 years now. It's very interesting to track it back over time and to realize that um, Goldschmidt, for example, the, the father of geochemistry, spent a lot of time and effort working in Norway between the two world wars to try and find an alternative to German potash, because German Germany was a key producer of potash between the two world wars. And in Norway, they needed to have an independent source, as did, as did Britain and North America. And Goldschmidt pioneered looking at nepheline cyanite as a source of potash. And a lot of his work published in Norwegian at that time, which is barely accessible now to us, unfortunately, looks at these nepheline cyanites as sources of potash. And that knowledge is as valid now as it was then. But of course, it got overtaken by events after the Second World War, where Potash Corporation of Canada really boomed. So looking at some of the alternatives, we've got some hints from the, the grandfathers of that subject. And we've got hints, more than hints, from geochemists who work in other parts of the world. And the Global South has a view, which we don't often hear. Otton Leonardos, who's a Brazilian geochemist, he worked with Bill Fife, who some of you will know the name of Bill Fife, is one of the, the most uh, stimulating geochemists that we um, have had on the planet in my lifetime, that's for sure. Um, but basically, he castigates the work of Rothamsted, which is not that far up the road here. If the 
um, a standard concept, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that the standard concept in technology of fertilizer design is derived from low laws who set up Rothenstedt effectively as the grandfather of Rothenstedt, uh, looking at superphosphate and salts 150 years ago. But had fertilizer technology been developed for deep leach laterite soils of the tropics, it would be very, very different. The problem is that fertilizers in the world fertilizer industry has been based on designing materials for fertilizer use according to the soils which we have in the UK and in the Northern Hemisphere. And there's no surprise that they actually work, but they don't work as well as they could do in tropical soils where you need a different approach to life. And Leonardos and his colleagues in Brazil have been the driving force behind this. So what are the alternatives? Well, here are the salts that we talked about earlier on. And then the potassium silicates include felspar, which is probably the commonest mineral on the planet, which has got 17% K2O, the same potassium content equivalent as carmelite. Lucite and methylene, rare minerals, but important minerals, they've got significant amounts of potassium as well. And then the micas, maybe 10 or 11% potassium. So, so we've got minerals that we can use for alternative sources. The problem is they're not seen as being reactive and effective because of that, uh, from the acceptable wisdom that comes from where we live here and now. So sylvite is the potassium salt. That's the Rolls-Royce, if you like. You, you really want to go for that. The Soil Association permits that to be used, uh, which is uh, quite remarkable in some ways, given that it's a, a, a soluble chemical. Um, carnalite is not so widely available, but it introduces magnesium, which is beneficial. But polyhalite, this is a mineral from Whitby. It used to be mined in the US. Uh, it's now <laughs> being mined in the existing potash mine in Yorkshire, which is due to close down, unfortunately. Uh, for different reasons, but the new mine would take this on board. Calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sulfate, all of them beneficial. You have a multi-use mineral here, which is actually one of the main attractions for a new prospect in Yorkshire. But in the Global South, when we look at the soils that are there, we see different soils. We've got oxide soils and we've got peat soils. And these are the soils which lack silica. So here we've got an opportunity for these silicate minerals to add not just potassium, but to add silicon as well, and so support crops in two different ways, with two different regions. And that's what's been going on in Brazil over the last few years. There's a company called Terrativa that has decided to cock a snook at the world fertilizer market. They're waiting for the horses' heads to end up on their pillows. But they're looking at the production of cyanite, a felspar-bearing rock, in the Cerrado. So this gray area is the agricultural uh, province of Brazil based in the Cerrado, the Agricultural areas within that province are shaded in this brown color. Uh, the habitat elsewhere is very precious. And of course, one of the objectives here is to try to preserve that habitat by keeping the agricultural areas productive. What they've done is they've mapped out different cyanide prospects in different places. And they are trying to supply half of Brazil's potash requirements from cyanide mines, where it's felspar that's the active ingredient that goes onto the soil. The economics are such that the transport is greatly reduced here. Most of the imported fertilizer lands at Santos here. It's $100 a tonne just to get it from there to there on top of the high price that you, deliver, uh, you pay to get it delivered there in the first instance. So these are, this is an approach which has got a, as time seems to have come. And what we hope to see is the knowledge that comes out of this work in Brazil helping to change things in Africa. And that, that's something which is, is gradually gathering some momentum having the confidence to break away from accepted wisdom, in other words. Now, in Northeast England, we grow leeks. And we grow leeks for all sorts of purposes. But one of the good things about leeks is that you can use them to test whether or not a mineral that is the only source of K in a plant pot is actually delivering K or not. And you can do experiments where you put the other nutrients in using various solutions. You stop anything disappearing from the bottom. You check all the minerals. The nice thing about leeks, though, is that you measure their growth by measuring their waste, see how fat they grow and how quickly they grow. Very easy to do a quick experiment. And you come up with results like this, which show that given that there's no other source of potassium in the pot, OK, the felspar is struggling to keep up with the KCL, but it's certainly doing something. So that's, that's kind of good news. And then if you put mica into the equation, you find that mica is just as good as KCL. Cation exchange on micas, a cation in solution for KCL. It's not surprising, but micas are a really, really useful source of K. And that's been known for years. But then when you look at the potassium content of the plant itself, you see that you can get potassium out of felspar. You can get as much potassium out of felspar with a leak as you can from KCL. But micas, again, are the kings. So we've got evidence that plants are able to get 
the mineral to dissolve and to liberate its potassium. But we can't do that using standard leaching tests. You can't treat a, a mineral with the, uh, an acid or something and get the same result. So that, that creates a problem. So let's have a look at what felspars look like when they've been in the soil. And here we see corrosion in felspars that have been in soil for two years or less. And when we get close to, we see things like this. We see a sort of fractal landscape of corrosion of the felspar with filaments <coughs> running through it. Filaments of biological origin and round things, which are bugs. This is bug heaven. This is a, a, a hotel for bacteria. And so one of the critical things about this is that the dissolution of these minerals actually depends on biology. And it makes you wonder whether or not life has evolved to enable felspars to be used as a source of many of the nutrients that plants require, and that, that, that biology requires. So you could argue, if you're a felspar fan, that there would be no life if there were not felspars on the planet. So just to pull this bit together before moving on to the climate change bit, the critical things to think of here are minerals in the geological sense are absolutely vital to feed society. Well, that, that's a good message to go home with, particularly when you've got your weekly shop coming up. The, the challenge of the next 40 years is absolutely enormous. Critically, the materials that we need are in the ground. I mean, there's no geological reason why we can't feed the, the population of the planet. But what we need is to use our research and other ways of attracting knowledge, of generating knowledge, to, to rise to this challenge. So, change of gear, but there'll be some overlap, looking at minerals and their reactions in soils relating to carbon and climate change. This is a much shorter story. In soils, minerals weather, and they remove CO2 from the atmosphere. They've done so ever since the atmosphere and the crust were formed. So it's a very well-known buffering effect. And we also know that carbonate minerals precipitate in soils. And by doing so, they form as permanent a sink for atmospheric CO2 as limestone precipitating in the ocean forms a, a sink for carbon that's in the ocean. We know that the trajectory for the rise of atmospheric CO2 actually tracks back to where it meets the expected trend about 8,000 years ago, which is when agriculture started. So you could argue that all this trouble we've got with excess CO2 in the atmosphere dates back to the origin of civilization and agriculture. That's basically a consequence of human life that dates back so far. It's not just simply related to us burning fossil fuels. We, you know, we, we started causing trouble right from the very beginning. It's not just something that uh, we, we're new to doing. So how do we compensate for that? We look at the mitigation. We look at what are called the seven wedges of mitigation and a number of changes to this as, as time's gone on. But this is as usual, see CO2 rising and to keep CO2 at 500 ppm, it's a huge task. Seven billion, seven gigatons of carbon per year need to be taken out of this. So that's a big ask. Why not just have seven lots of one? It's so much easier to find a way of getting one gigaton of carbon out of the atmosphere than seven gigatons. So what would the wedges be that we could use for that? Here, we want to look at the carbon cycle in soils. And to think about soils in a number of creative ways. So if we look at the carbon cycle globally, we normally think of the ocean and the atmosphere as being the dominant players in that. But when you couple soil and plants together and you add up the exchange, you find you've got 300 gigatons per year exchanging between soil and the atmosphere as opposed to 180 between the atmosphere and the ocean. So soils actually do more work in this respect than the ocean does. And we can take advantage of that because we're land living creatures. We've been causing trouble with soils for 8,000 years or more. We can exploit this. If we want to make a difference, we should work with soils to do that especially when we think that a, an amount equivalent to a sixth of all the carbon in the atmosphere passes through the plant soil system annually. So you know, we could make a difference in six years if we wanted to. It could happen very, very quickly. So where is that carbon? Well, most of it is in plants. And to get an idea of the perspective here, these giant trees have got a little lad here. So you know, they, they, they clearly outnumber the human animal. 99% of the carbon in the global terrestrial biomass is in plants. And 92% of that's in forests, 95% of that's in wood. So huge quantities are held in wood. The no-brainer is that we ought to make sure the carbon stays in wood as much as we possibly can. When we look at the carbon cycle from the perspective of soils, we see photosynthesis doing its work, plants giving back half of what's been photosynthesized, soil giving back half. So how can we trap some of that carbon and keep it in the soil? That's the challenge. It's going through a nice cycle, which is a virtual circle of net, no gain, no loss. So what can we do to capture that carbon? Well, there are a number of carbon sinks in soils. We can include groundwater, where we can think of the bicarbonate contents that you 
see on the bottle of water when you look at the label and read the analysis, some of that would have come through plants. We've got organic matter in soils, which we can see in, in, in soils, we need to preserve that. But we can see carbonate minerals in soils, like here, a natural soil with a pebble with a, a pendant of calcium carbonate forming on it. So we know calcium carbonate can form in soils naturally. So to capture this, we've got two opportunities, one with carbonate minerals and biochar, which I'm not going to talk about because biochar is completely organic and we, we don't want to get involved with that, we talk about minerals. So that's a question for later if need be. But if we can do something to increase this, we, we start turning that respiration round to 80 minus X. We start to turn the gigaton per year into a benefit rather than a neutral. We're seeing the carbon accumulating in soil. Carbonates in soils. Well, we dig holes in you over the years. You can pull bricks out of some of these holes and you can find these white spots on bricks. Fragile, they've formed in the soil, they're calcium carbonate concretions that have formed in the 20, 30 years in this particular case since that brick was put in the soil. You can do the carbon isotopes on that and you can show that it's photosynthetic carbon that's gone through the system. You can do carbon dating on it and show that a large part of it is very young carbon. So it's not geological carbon that's being immobilized. You can see on a fragment of slag, a carbonate rim on that fragment of slag, which shows carbonate again precipitating in slag that's on a soil. This is from a concert where a steelworks was demolished uh, many years ago now, but where there's still several million tons of slag happily carbonating away. So we know these artificial, slag, uh, artificial sinks for carbon are there. So how much and how fast? And here, this is work which uh, I'm referring to in Newcastle City Centre. This is the site of the Newcastle Brewery, where Newcastle Brown Ale came from. St James's Park, where football happens, is over there, just so everyone knows exactly where we are. We've been able to work on this site over a number of years with a team of people looking at carbon in that soil, measuring how much is there. We find almost twice as much carbon in the soil as carbonate as you find in agricultural soils as organic carbon. People have neglected uh, urban soils, and now we're finding that actually we shouldn't neglect them, we should pay attention to that. And we find that we get the carbon isotope data consistently showing a photosynthetic input, but allowing us to measure the amount of inorganic carbon that's coming in from limestone and other geological sources as well. So we get quite a good handle on where this comes from. That site has the capacity in 10 hectares to move at least 65,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere based on carbonation of all the calcium that's there. But measurements have been made, and Carla did this as part of her work, to show that we can actually remove 85 tonnes of carbon dioxide annually per hectare from the uh, atmosphere at this site through simple carbonation of the material that's in the ground. We've measured it, so you can't dispute a measurement of that type. So the equivalent of that would be to take a million tonnes of CO2 out of the atmosphere. You need 12,000 hectares of land, which is about a fifth of the land associated with highways in this country. So it's not a huge amount of land. We could start to manage land in the urban environment. There's enough of it being becoming available, being turned over in new developments to enable us to plan to remove several million tonnes of CO2 per year from the atmosphere through natural processes of carbonation in soils. And that's through reactions between organic matter in the soils, the plants that are growing there, and the calcium that's liberated from the silicates that weather. Well, that calcite forms, how long does it last for? Well, it's potentially as stable as limestone, as ocean limestone. There's limestone in Derbyshire, limestone in Avon, limestone that we see in the hills. It will dissolve, of course, but the carbon remains as bicarbonate when limestones naturally dissolve. It goes into the groundwater system. So it doesn't necessarily enter the atmosphere. It stays in the geosphere. But the critical points to bear in mind are that as this calcium carbonate grows, it cements the soil, if you like, together. That increases strength, which is a good thing. But it might also reduce permeability, which might be a bad thing, and increase urban flooding. So we don't want to have that happen. We need to investigate these things, and we're doing so. But in terms of the way in which this might be implemented, the concept of carbon capture gardens comes to mind. A way in which you can go to a demolition site, you can set out some plots to grow uh, plants which make it attractive, you're enhancing ecosystem services. People like that. People like looking at what happens when you add compost to crushed concrete. Because what you get is it gets green, it grows, and you end up with the compost carbon being stabilized by the uh, formation of calcium carbonate, compost naturally turns over very quickly. You put it in the soil and it goes back into the atmosphere very quickly. If you capture it as calcium carbonate, it helps stabilize the compost. And you end up with things like this, meadows in the city center. That's with compost, that's without compost. It's on its way, it will take a while to get there, but 
with compost, you can end up with something like this. A very, very nice rural scene with St. James's Park in the background. So, sorry for that. We're currently working on this, uh, looking at what will grow there, what the effects are on the soil quality. We have a project which you can look at on Newcastle University's website called SUCCESS, the acronym competition winner, Sustainable Urban Carbon Capture Through Enhancing the Soil Sink. Anyway, that's uh, another matter. So the key reactions to bear in mind here are that the plant is acting as a pump. Photosynthesis is fixing carbon. The carbon that we see at the surface when we look at a plant is only half of that carbon. The other half of it's going to the root system. And roots can be regarded as sort of an inside-out mouth because they're busily exuding organic acids, the plant equivalent to saliva. And that's attacking the minerals that are present in the soil to give the plant the nutrients that it needs and to tie up some of the harmful, potentially harmful components that are there. Bugs, microbes, love these organic acids and they necessarily end up as CO2 through the, the microbial metabolism that takes place. Some of that CO2 then partitions into water as carbonic acid. The carbonic acid in the base much simplified reaction with calcium silicates is giving you calcium carbonate and then releasing silica, which the plant needs. So it goes back to what we're talking about with potash and the mineral reactions which take place. The critical thing is to regard plants as a CO2 pump. They're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and pumping it into soil, and we have to be clever about how we capture it in the soil. That reaction can be very much simplified. Organic matter plus calcium equals limestone, if you don't like the balanced chemical equations. So bringing this together, we see in conclusion here that soils are really important reservoirs for carbon, particularly urban soils. Urban soils have a major role to play in carbon capture. We manage them. We manage them in ways which give us the built environment that we take for granted. And we've got ways in which we can build carbonate minerals into that design. We also find that carbonate precipitation can be used to help stabilize organic carbon that would otherwise be composted and then lost by going by decay into the atmosphere. But carbonate precipitation permanently fixes carbon that was once in compost, and that's something which we can take advantage of because pretestable matter, material that rots, is a big problem for us in our management of the carbon cycle. All this boils down to knowing what minerals do and understanding the way in which minerals behave. And when I talk to biologists, a lot of biologists think of minerals as being things which sit in glass cases and do nothing. But when you look at them in soils and other environments, you realize how dynamic they are. And after all, we, we ought to be well aware of that because, of course, we all depend on minerals for uh, our bones, our teeth, and things like that. We know they're dynamic in that sense. And we know that every harvest of wheat is taking millions of tons of silica out of the soil. So we know that silicate minerals are reacting, even in our own soils, where we can't measure that reaction. A couple of parting shots. I've given you two examples of how minerals might contribute to solving some of the big problems that face the world, and how that solution is based on our understanding of mineralogy, geochemistry, our understanding of how minerals behave in natural systems. Food security depends on mined materials and our understanding of how the minerals behave in soil systems. And long-term carbon sequestration ultimately depends on minerals as well, because we do want to have a carbonate sink rather than anything that might be more ephemeral. Where would we be without minerals? They're going to help us save the planet. That's what I want you to have as a message to take away and to think about when you next go on your weekly shop. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much, David. Um, got some time for questions. Man in the front there. Uh, would it not be uh, as well uh, to remember that we memorial speed and we may well breathe? Yeah. And yes. um, what you're uh, presenting there is uh, the long route, route to, I don't know, uh, really, um, salvation, etc. Uh, feeding to those uh, 
Mm. Where is it going This is an unanswerable question, isn't it? <laughs> because it's how, what is the carrying capacity of the planet? And uh, that, that's a critical question. And none of us know the answer to that. Very few of us are brave enough to even ask that question, let alone start to think about it. So I think that's um, a, a question for another place, I'm afraid. I'm not going to be able to answer that question today. Uh, very interesting. Um, I live in Harpenden, mm. and most of my friends work at Rothamsted on soils. Yes. In the last 30 years, funding for agricultural research has dropped by something like 30%. Mm. What indication do you have from the present government that all these serious problems you've got will be taken more seriously than they've been for the last 30 years? That's another question that I can't answer like the first one. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, the, this is one of the interesting things because my day job is Professor of Soil Science at uh, Newcastle University. And I obviously have a lot of contact with Rothenstedt and suffer the same problems of funding. And um, I've found that some of the answers are coming from outside this country. So I'm talking about that work in Brazil. And the, uh, that, that is research work that's been funded by Brazil and uh, is actually opening the door to uh, finding new answers. And I, I, I sometimes think that we will only make progress in this country by pulling money in from outside this country where governments are concerned and, the, uh, and they, they, they're able to prioritise what we want to do as a higher priority than our own government is able to do. There's still room for good science and the BBSRC will still fund good science. You talked about putrescence, mm -hmm. landfills. Is there a possibility to mine the landfill and somehow combine it to lock up carbon dioxide? Yes, I love landfills. I've spent a lot of time plodging around in landfills. Um, the landfills are one of the best carbon sinks that there actually is because this business of calcium carbonate precipitation actually takes place in a landfill and you can show that 40% of the carbon that goes into a landfill when putrescible matter was allowed to go into a landfill is actually fixed as calcium carbonate and every landfill operator knows that because it fouls up the drains and stops them being able to pump leachate around the landfill so it gives them water management problems. But um, the rules don't permit that. So. Uh, what we need to think about is, 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 is um, how you deal with putrescible matter in a way that can do this. And should we not perhaps then go back to looking at landfills as a, a, um, a, a, a reactor that could be used as a calcium carbonate fixing point rather than uh, anything else? But of course, there are no more landfills being built in this country because uh, it, it's been banned, hasn't it? Um, you've been talking a lot about the potential cures to uh, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, mm. but what about melting permafrost? Mm. Um, because that, the, that produce, the methane produced could probably far yeah. outweigh anything proposed in your lecture. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're not addressing methane at all or other greenhouse gases in this lecture. So the, 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 that, that's a separate issue. And there's probably no way that minerals can actually help with that in the same way that it's a simple way in which minerals can help calm dioxide. So um, that's a real problem for us that we have to, to pay attention to. And uh, it's, it's one of those problems which I think you know, I haven't got an answer to. Um, I look to my microbiological colleagues uh, for, for their inspiration, but it's quite uh, it's not an easy one to deal with. Um, You, you are suggesting that uh, increasing, maximizing plant growth will have a beneficial effect on carbon capture, but more plant life will mean more nutrients being extracted from the soil. And isn't that, in the long run, going to be a, a danger? Yeah, it depends on the way you, you do this. And of course, different plants have different effects. So it's a, a pretty glib statement to say go out and plant trees, because in some places, trees don't necessarily do as much good as, uh, as they do in others. Uh, the, what I would consider there is the um, the way in which trees can be planted on land which isn't agricultural. So you're looking at ways in which forests can be reintroduced to areas where there's no possibility of, of, of growing plants uh, uh, for crops. Um, but the, um, there are opportunities to, to reforest ground in this country and elsewhere, paying attention to the soil and the rocks that underpin that soil and to think about how slow-growing trees can draw nutrition from the rocks, which are naturally weathering. And so 
take advantage of that natural process, that balanced process of providing the nutrients that the trees require without the artificial approach which we have to growing crops where we're really flogging the soil to get repeated production of, of crops which we take away. So, that, so there's more than one angle to this and I think that we can find ways of attacking. Can you, can you tell us if any work has been done on those microbes which seem to enjoy corroding the feldspars in the soil and rocks generally? The, 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 there's work beginning to be done. I mean, it's an area of active research. A number of people have looked at associations between microbes and different minerals. And, and, and there are a number of microbiologists who are particularly interested in extreme environments where uh, they might be deep geological environments, they might be extremely arid environments, um, and Arctic islands or the Atacama Desert and places like that, where uh, the the microbial community is of great interest. And so a number of um, advanced molecular techniques are being used to describe what is there. And then the question then is, well, how can you stimulate them uh, to find out which ones respond to a stimulus that might enable them to do the damage which we've seen? Last question. I mean, the, the tungsten mine in Cornwall mm. or the potash mine in Whitby, are, are those actually economic now sustainable things, or are they almost more of a strategic decision by the government to say we need, we need to have our own supplies here? Uh, well, the tungsten mine is producing all at the present time, and so there's a business that is operating with no subsidies, of course, to, to mine that and hope to make a profit. Uh, so it's, it's purely commercial incentives that have done this. It's not as though the government said we need to have a potash mine or a tungsten mine. Uh, there, there are companies that have come along and, and then worked very hard to get to this point where they've been able to seek permission, and indeed in Hamilton, to, um, uh, to, to break ground. So it's a commercial decision that drives these developments. And then the, the decision about permission to go ahead with that mine depends on local government in the first instance, and national government, if it was referred to national government uh, for review, would then take the decision if need be. So they'd, they'd be more encouraging than they might have done in the past? Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think the, with the potash mine, there's been a heck of a lot of work done to uh, help local government come to a decision which was in the company's favour. Good. If there are no more questions, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.